Yeah. Is and having an adoptive, an adoptive mother, another person in the mix. Now, it doesn't matter if my father, my father, I didn't not see after I was three and a half, so that doesn't have any relevance. It's um, your father, who you didn't see before, who was there before three and a half, certainly had an impact on your life. And your stepfather has also had an impact on your life. Both of them have. And how, and how that's affected you emotionally has affected how you view God on the masculine side. This is why many of you feel comfortable when I say God is a mother, but don't feel comfortable when, you say, when I say God's father. And this is why I mix the two terms quite a lot when I'm talking about God being mother or father, is because I'm I, I feeling the emotional injuries that we have and just responding by saying that God is the opposite person you want them to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. So allow yourself to deal with both injuries because if both injuries will be certainly reflected by the injuries you've received from your parents. And by the way, this is not... Remember, you can't blame your parents per se because it's a transgenerational injury being imposed upon each one of those people and then upon yourself. So in the end, it's due to all of these transgenerational injuries that have caused these problems inside of ourselves. The key is for us to identify them, see them, release them, like a child would, in full. The problem is, is, when you felt something with your mother, she didn't let you release it. When you felt something with your father, he didn't let you release it. And that's why you still have it. And all we need to do is release it, and we'll, we'll have gotten through a lot of these emotions. And maybe Sarai first, and then go back. Um, um, getting back to uh, this lady who we just talking about, um, have you heard of a, a, a process called Podoshka? Called? I think it's Podoshka, too. You said it? Podoshka? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know a lot about it, but I just did a, uh, read a little bit about it. It's de armoring. And um, there's uh, uh, <coughs> the person actually is masturbating while people of the opposite sex are massaging them to work through uh, sexual injuries, I suppose. Right. Um, can, I, can I make a comment about any form of working through sexual injuries with another person? Um, there is danger in working through them without being in a loving relationship. In other words, just pay, going to someone who's a therapist who then helps you work through your sexual injuries. Straight away, just the process of paying them sets up a transaction emotionally inside of you that is totally different from what you actually need sexually. What we need sexually is unconditional love. We need that at a sexual level. And so what happens often with any form of sexual therapy, often there are other people who we're paying being involved in the therapy. And there is a large amount of damage that damage that that can actually give us if we're not aware of what's going on. So my suggestion is it's far better to work through every issue with God rather than with other people necessarily. Remember that you can work through all of these issues by yourself. You can, if you have the courage to do so. And sure, those kind of techniques certainly can de-armour you or get rid of your castle surrounding sex, if you like. But the problem with them is that there is often lots of different emotions in a therapist who's doing those kind of things to you. And there's also lots of different emotions in the spirits connected to the therapist who's doing those things to you. There's a reason why they chose that job. Does that make sense? So, for instance, a lot of like tantric sex therapists, for example, actually allow you to have sexual interactions with them in order to teach you things about sexuality. There is huge dangers in you doing that at the soul level because this is a paid interaction where there is no love aside from a, a very, like they say they love you, but in reality there is, some, there is no love. You don't, how can you love someone you don't even know and it's the first time you've ever met them, right? You get to know them and then love them that way, right? So when I'm talking about love being involved in action, I'm talking about love based on knowledge of who the person is and getting to know them, not love based on this very general agape type of love where you love everybody no matter who they are. Because if I did that, then I'd have sex with everybody. 
why, why would I do that without having some major injuries? So if you've got a therapist, so here's a therapist, here's yourself. As soon as you enter into therapy, there's usually a paid amount, there's usually paid therapy for a start, agree? Right? So straight away you've set up a, a, a conundrum for your own soul, and that is they won't work with my injury unless they get paid. So is that unconditional love? No. So let's say now I had a therapist who doesn't get paid and they're working through my sexual injuries. And I'm not talking about just talking about my sexual injuries. They're actually physically allowing themselves to have sex with you to work through your injuries. Or you are involved in a sexual act while they are touching you to work through your injuries. Now, if those things occur, what are they? The question you've got to ask is, what are they getting and what are they giving? There's got to be something going on inside of them emotionally for them to want to connect to many people sexually in a day, other than the partner that they're with. What is that? What emotion is in them causing them to do that? Do you see what I'm saying? There must be some very, very highly charged sexual-based injuries that cause them to want to have sexual interactions in order to... So obviously they think they're being helpful, they think they're healing this person, but why do they want to have sex with person after person after person, or have sexual interactions with person after person after person in one day? And not with their partner, like not just with their partner. So there's got to be some major emotional injuries in the person for them to desire that even. Does everyone see what I'm saying? All right. Now, that being the case, chosen their profession, is that there are unhealed things within themselves and that's why they've generally chosen the profession. Now, that bear, bearing that in mind, generally a sex therapist will have unhealed things sexually within themselves that they're dealing with. That attracts a group of spirits generally too, right? All surrounding them, so spirits surrounding them that now will use this interaction with the client in order for them to have a sexual experience, right? So how does a person... So let's say there's a woman sex therapist uh, teaching tantric sex to students and she has 10 students a day. How does she actually have these interactions with people and actually experience orgasms or whatever else that may occur during these interactions? How does she actually do it? without there being some external involvement in the process. There must be a part of her soul that is still detuned from herself, because in the end, she would just desire to have sex with one person. She wouldn't feel like she's desirous of having sex with others. So there has to be an emotion within him or her that causes them to be attracted to this kind of therapy. And that emotion is going to not be healed until they work through that issue emotionally. So while they may help de-armour you, like the saying might goes, or reduce the, increase the allowance of vulnerability in you towards sexual matters, they are actually also projecting many other emotions at you, which may also be damaging you right at the same moment. And so what I'm suggesting is don't involve yourself in forms of therapy that have the potentiality of damaging you at exactly the same time. One of the reasons I'm asking, actually, the, the photos that just came up when I, when I heard what this lady was saying, that uh, I actually had the opportunity to train as a tantric masseuse. Yep. And um, and I was actually woken up in the night about three in the morning, and it was like I was being spoken to. Um, You've really got to go and do this, and um, it's almost like if you said the spirits sort of saying, "You got to do this, right?" Because um, this is going to be really good for you and you can make a lot of money and blah, blah, blah. Exactly. And uh, and I was very suspicious of it, sort of holding it away and wanting to actually listen, come to this particular talk yeah. for ages to yeah. wait for. Yeah. <laughs> and to talk to you about, um, about that. But that's clarified a lot of things for me. Yeah, so here's yourself. What was happening was there was a spirit who felt that you might be suggestive to the idea of entering into a, as a tantric massage therapist or a tantric therapist. And because these spirits are very, very interested in having as many people as possible in that place where they can have sex with lots of different people under the guise of money, right? 
they of course want to heavily influence you, so they will come and give you messages, they will give you all these indications, and many of us, because we're influenced in a new age way with regard to spirits, we think, oh, that must be the universe telling me I need to do that. Do you know what I mean? So we go along with that. But actually it's the spirits manipulating us through whatever injury we may have, right, to cause us to even consider it, and then, and, and then get us involved in the process. And once we get involved in the process, it's very difficult to stop. Because they become more powerful. They become more powerful. Our sexual powerfulness, which attracted them, our powerlessness, which attracted them, starts being generated more and more. Th our sexual power becomes stronger. And as a result, we become addicted to the feeling of sexual power. And we can't give it up. It becomes like a cigarette that I've got to have every day. And you'll find that many tantric sex therapists finish up having sex with all sorts of different people at all sorts of different times. And, and are totally addicted to that process, and it's totally because of the spirit interaction that they are addicted to the process. Mm -hmm. um, now, the reason why I became very interested in the Tantra to begin with is yep. 10 years ago, um, with a, a sexual partner of mine, yep. uh, I was experiencing um, something that I've never ever read about, I yep. actually haven't even read about it since, um, and that is the, the chakra connection that you're talking about during sex. And um, uh, actually, this, this guy so it was, it was an older guy, and he was having some um, impotency problems. But that didn't seem to really matter. What I did was um, I felt that it was almost like a, an energetic penis come out of my solar plexus, yeah. which I was um, making love with him, with this uh, energy. And um, it was quite incredibly powerful, not like anything I've felt physically. Exactly. And um, and quite remarkably, he became erect, and then when he came, um, you know, actually had physical sex with me, it was the most incredible experience I've ever had and never had again. Yes. He had some deep anger issues with women, actually. Right? And you know that you attract angry men. Right? So angry men are attracted to you. And what actually happened was that sexually, and his impotence was actually caused by his anger. But, but what was happening is he was also connected at the spirit level to his own body. And the spirit, at the spirit level could engage in sexual interactions. And all that happened was a spirit connected to him in that interaction, heightened the experiences of his spirit body, which actually caused his erection, and then allowed this interaction to occur between the two of you. Right? So the truth is you can have that kind of sexual interaction with a person without spirits, but in that particular instance there was a spirit involved in the process. What about my side of it? That was there a spirit um, as yeah. well? Yeah, there was. A male spirit. Oh, okay. Yes, actually. That's why you felt like there was yeah. this penis inside right. of you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Still, um, I'm still quite... I'd really like to um, ask you two how... Um, how it is with you on the chakra level uh, when you both make love. And it's not as good as it could be because... It depends on what emotions are there at the time. Yeah, so so we we have some days where we might have sex four or five times a day and it'd be really, really good. Other times when we go without for a week on end or whatever mm -hmm. and not be very good when we, when we, when we make love because because of the emotions that we're working through at the time. And the emotions would be blocking certain chakras? Yes. Uh, so <coughs> on a good day, when your chakras are unblocked, both of you... Mine are never unblocked. Okay. Not yet, anyway. So, and I, I am still working through heaps of stuff about shame, sexual shame, so... So, yeah. so would, would, even though I had spiritual influence there, if I could achieve that without the spiritual influence, which of course happened because of my emotional injuries, um, would it be similar? Like, um, and yep. I, I couldn't imagine actually connecting in that kind of way with every chakra would be incredible. Yeah, it would. It is, like obviously we've had nearly 2,000 years of experience of that, that a lot of which Mary can't remember, but I can. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And, uh, like, I cry about it every time I think about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, AJ was writing the outline and crying about it. I was writing this outline for yesterday and crying about it. Because just missing it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
the issue is that yes, you can achieve that kind of experience yourself. You can certainly achieve it by yourself, but only by removing the emotional injuries towards men and women. You know, the, the intergenerational transgender emotional injuries that we have. And so, if you can allow yourself to do that, you will actually obtain these experiences without spirit's influence. But the majority of tantric sexual experiences that are occurring in these kind of classroom type environments are actually heavily uh, dominated by spirits who are just having fun sexually uh, because they can't do the same thing in the spirit world. So you're actually getting raped, but not knowing it and feeling it's a good experience. Well, by the spirits. By the spirits, yeah. yeah. And that's why many times when we have those experiences, and many times when you go into a room with those kind of things going on, there's this really sleazy feeling that most people feel right at the beginning, and they've got to actually overcome that sleazy feeling to become involved. The sleazy feeling that you have is actually there's a lot more going on than what's just in the room. There's a lot of spirit involvement going on right at that same moment. Yeah. And there are literally millions of spirits wanting more and more tantric things going on, or you know, people who are willing to have lots of sex going on with all different partners in order for them to experience their own sexual issues. Also, um, really putting myself right out there, I have actually worked as a prostitute in the past. Yep. And um, and I can see, you know, the emotional injuries that uh, have brought those about. Yep. But I also heard you say that the um, the soul injury that happens, like. You know, I, I, I'd really like to know what is it that I need to uh, help myself in, in overcoming the, the injury to my soul through having done that. When work. you were a prostitute, ask yourself what emotions you were getting from it. Yeah, feeling powerful, actually. That's it, power. All right. So the addiction is the addiction of power, which means with regard to the sexual act, you actually have a feeling of powerlessness that you need to feel. When you feel the powerlessness sexually, what will happen is that emotion or addiction for powerful sex will be removed from you and you won't be drawn into anything that would cause those kind of interactions. For instance, tantric sex therapy or, or prostitution or any of those things. Does that make sense? Yeah, would that actually, the powerlessness come from my, um, uh, I had a, a experience when I was between five and six, probably over a year of uh, um, having intercourse actually at, at that age, between five and six, with a, a boy who was 12 or 13. Yeah. And it was, uh, so, I, I didn't know what it was, of course he said it was a game. Yeah. So, you know, being deceived and so on. Yeah, exactly. There's lots of related to that event. Okay. There's also, though, that event was a law of attraction event. Yes. And there are issues surrounding your father mm -hmm. that need to be looked at with regard to why this boy felt he could do that to you. Yeah, I've been sort of digging around and <laughs> working on it for it's a lot of stuff. But if you allow yourself to go into that emotional transaction that happened between yourself and the boy when you were sick, there was a feeling in you at that time of power, like that you actually could control him as well by giving your body to him. So there was also this feeling of power that began to be developed then. Uh, yeah, yeah, yep. it, yeah. And the key is for you to allow yourself to look at that more emotionally rather than living on the addiction of it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's it. That's it? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, sexual power is often the form, like men rape because of that issue, right? Many women enter prostitution because of the same issue, right? And I'm not talking about the women who are abused in prostitution, I'm talking about the ones who you know, grow up having a relatively good life, seemingly have a relatively good life, I should say, and then they enter prostitution because it gives them a feeling of power and a feeling that they're actually quite self-assured with regard to their own sexuality and so forth. Power is a big issue in sex, a huge issue in sex. And it's one of the main injuries that we have when we, when we have sex. And it's also one of the main reasons why, in many sexual interactions, we only get off in certain, or we only become aroused in certain situations because we're either feeling powerless or powerful. And there's no harm in feeling powerful sexually, but there is harm if it's out of harmony with love of self or the other person.
Uh, there'll be a lot of grief um, about it, se sexual grief, because it, the powerless feeling usually can only come from an interaction in our childhood surrounding the opposite gender where that has been very abusive, either verbally, physically, emotionally, or even sexually. So, so there will be those kind of events come up in the processing of that kind of emotion. The key is, um, let the trigger, whatever the law of attraction brings you is the trigger, feel the trigger, and then go into that emotion as a child would go into the emotion. And you'll soon come up with what the event was after that. There was someone putting up their hand. This gentleman at the back. Oh, yeah, that's right. We've skipped so many around. Yeah. I understand the importance of feeling emotion. Yep. To go release emotion blocks related to that. In the discussion I had on forgiveness, I actually said the actual releasing of the emotional block is what creates forgiveness. So, for example, in the previous example that you brought up, uh, Louise brought up about her mother and father. Her mother had, remember, I drew her mother had the feeling that, uh, what was it? She was repelled by sex, right? But when, when Louise, uh, feels that emotion and releases that emotion, she will forgive her mother for that emotion when she's released that emotion herself. Does that make sense? Once she's released that emotion herself, her mother will feel forgiven for creating that emotion. And ironically, it may actually help her mother then deal with that emotion. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. And it's probably time to have a break because it's quarter past three. Um, they've got quite a lot of questions still, so there's plenty, of, there's plenty of things coming up yet about things with regard to sexuality. Let's start. Awesome. Up. Okay, what we're going to do now is that we've got a series of questions that people have been too shy to ask in a public way. So uh, what, what Mary's going to do is read out the questions or statements, and then I'll try to answer them as best as I can or as best as we can. So um, we'll get started with those. But, before we get started, um, firstly, I just wanted to thank Peter again for making his home available. <laughs> the second air conditioner is in. Uh, for those of you who donated to that, that's very good. Thank you very much. That's, that means now that we can speak with our... <laughs> and uh, um, I'd just like to also remind you that the next, the next session that we'll be having is actually after Easter in April. So it's April, I think it's the 17th and 18th. That's here at ULO. And then the following weekend is the mediumship uh, weekend, I suppose you call it, where we will have a session on Friday night for two hours from 7 till 9, which will be specifically for helping mediums develop their gift. And then on the Saturday uh, and Sunday, we've got sessions like this. It'll be the anger session on Saturday. So <coughs> if we... Uh, that's in Brisbane. So the first, what we're doing with the medium se sessions is we're taking it one time to the Brisbane on a Friday night. And then the next time, the next month, it will be in Udlow on a Friday night. And it'll just be just going back and forth between the two locations. And that way, people in Brisbane have only one month, to, you know, one month where they have to travel up and people up here have one month to travel down, just sort of evens it out a bit. Those sessions will be taped, so uh, if you would like, if you'd like to, if you'd like to come along but missed it and you want to tape it, they'll be taped. Bear in mind that they are, those sessions are going to be specifically concentrating on uh, a number of things to do for these mediums to practice over the coming, over the following month. So. The idea with the uh, mediumship sessions is to, it's sort of like a process that we'll be going through. So if you miss one of the months, you'll miss one of the processes. So my <coughs> suggestion, if you do miss a month, is to try and find out from others what you know what we talked about, or dis and discuss it with others who were there, so that at least you've got an idea of the exercises you can try during the month. All right, well, let's get back to the sex subject, favourite subject. All right, let's get going. Okay. The first one's a great question. 
Um, okay, it's quite long, so I'll just read it all to you because um, this person's very, very good at explaining how they feel. I want to be loved and cherished. I think that is my addiction emotion. However, as soon as that looks likely, I get very scared and want to run away because the price to pay is always sex and sex is at best unpleasant and at worst a gross violation of my body. Actually, always that. Only mostly I suppress these feelings and just feel numb through the whole process. At, at least I used to. Now I'm relishing not being in a relationship and being able to run away and hide as soon as, look, as things start to look risky. But of course the price to pay is missing out on being loved and cherished. What is the poor treatment of myself that goes with my addiction emotions? I'm not sure. Looking unattractive as I can? Maybe, maybe not. Denying myself a close relationship seems more likely to me, but I don't know. Well, anyway, my mind counsels me, can, counsels me to stay away from close relationships. And if I follow the guidelines of going into my fear and feeling it, well, my fear of intimacy is the same thing as what I want, so it's difficult for me. I hope I've explained that correctly. I both fear and want intimacy. And there is also this awareness that my body is pretty yucky, especially breasts and sexual bits, and I'm ashamed to be uncovered. There's a place somewhere in, on the continu continuum of aloneness to intimacy where my desire turns into fear. So, to the confusion of the other person, I expect, I'm jiggling this crazy dance backwards, forwards. I have no personal memory of sexual abuse and I realise that doesn't matter. Except that if I'm to progress from numbness to anger, I don't know where to direct my anger. I'm conscious that those men who do come too close are only responding to my signals and can't possibly understand that I want intimacy without intimacy, if you see what I mean. <laughs> Alright, um, by the way, firstly, this is a very common problem, much more common than most people realise, where people are having this dance of wanting intimacy but not wanting sexual intimacy or wanting sexual intimacy without wanting intimacy. And usually there's a combination of those two things happening. So the best thing we can do is look at what's going on underneath the, at the emotional level. So <coughs> number one, and what I recommended to this lady was an email that was sent to me. Um, I asked her to write down why am I so afraid of my own body. So sexually. So obviously, firstly, one of the things that is causing her to step away from intimacy, so intimacy is a desire she has, but because it always comes at the price of sexual, a sexual relationship, which, and she finds sexual relationship quite disgusting and quite intrusive, there's this feeling that she's not allowed to have intimacy either. So as she correctly states, she starts with a desire, which is great, the desire for intimacy. But the desire leads her down this path that's looking like sexual intimacy, which she has some terrible fears about and shame about. And so, of course, that's going to turn off all desire. So the first thing is to make a list of all the things about your own body that you hate. Right? And really start confronting this in a sexual way. So uh, if you're a woman, for example, and you're afraid of your own sexual organs, my suggestion is get out a mirror, start looking at yourself, playing with yourself, fondling yourself, and start actually channel challenging how you respond sexually and why you feel so disgusted. And the way you challenge it is to actually get involved in, say, masturbation or something like that, and look at yourself as you're doing it, so don't close your eyes, but actually look at yourself as you're doing it, and then start allowing the emotions that are going to be triggered through that process to come up. So those emotions might be shame. So you allow the shame to start rising in you. Allow yourself to experience the shame. And when you experience the shame, you'll start feeling these hot, really dirty, hot type of disgusting emotions start flowing over you and keep breathing and allow yourself to experience it. 
and keep touching yourself and keep feeling it for as long as it takes to pass. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Allow yourself to continue doing this. And do this as a, like even, I would suggest, as a daily practice until the shame is actually gone from you. And I, I was just going to say that I've uh, experienced some of that sort of sexual shame and disgust with my own body. And um, I've watched a few DVDs on female orgasm and female uh, masturbation that are quite graphic. And I found that helped me as well. Yep. And, and also to look at the messages that I received about my own body, verbally and non-verbally, um, from women uh, specifically, I found that was quite powerful. A lot of the issues of shame about your own body if you're a woman will be coming from other women. Um, there are far less men ashamed of women's bodies than there are of women ashamed of their own bodies, trust me. <laughs> Most men are quite attractive if they are if they are heterosexual desires, they are quite attracted to a woman's body. But most women feel deep shame about their own bodies. And so it comes with these projections and feelings of shame that have gone down through the generations of women. And it's arrived at ourselves here in this, in this state. So firstly look at that. Why am I so afraid about my own body? Start allowing yourself to experiment with that question in a sexual manner in practice with your own body. So you don't have to involve a partner in it, just start experimenting with your own body in that way. Until you get to a point where you start feeling the shame, where you actually feel the hot feelings of shame pass through you because they are emotions that you will need to connect to and release. And allow yourself to keep doing that. And you, at the start you are going to find this very difficult. The reason why you find it very difficult is because most of the time we are so conditioned to do exactly the opposite of what causes us emotional pain. And this is what, what I'm suggesting to you is actually allow yourself to get into your own emotional pain on a sexual, in a sexual way. Now that is the total opposite to what most people want to do in a, with these kind of issues. So it's like flipping over your whole world doing that and allow yourself to start connecting to yourself sexually. The second thing I suggested was um, about the, yeah, to make a list of what anger I feel about my own body. Now, by the way, you can also replace what anger I feel about men's bodies what anger I feel about women's bodies in there, couldn't you? So, so if I'm a woman, for example, firstly, if I have a lot of sexual shame, there's also often generally anger that I feel about my own body. A lot of women feel things like, I, I don't want to be a woman because women get used, right, sexually. I don't want to be sexual because that's when men can use me. I don't want to abandon myself to my own, like, sexual experience because if I abandon myself and become vulnerable, that means I'll be vulnerable to a man. If I'm in a heterosexual, if I'm a heterosexual soul, that means I'll be vulnerable to a man. I don't want to be vulnerable to a man because then a man would be able to use me. That's actually the opposite of that in truth. The truth is the more open and vulnerable you are to your own emotions, the less somebody could use you. But we obviously have a false belief that more somebody will use it because that's our multi-generation belief. So make a list about what anger emotions you feel. A lot of women feel quite angry about having breasts or about having reproductive organs that result in having children. They feel quite angry about having to have children if they have sex. Quite angry about having to be the persons who look after the issue of contraception, for example. Quite angry that men have left them dangling when it comes to you know, looking after their children. So these are all multi-generational injuries that, that many women have. So ask yourself, what are those angry things that I feel about my body? Why do I find my body so disgusting? Let yourself connect with that emotionally again. So if you feel anger and rage, so if you're naked, touching yourself, feeling it, and then all of one of these feelings come up, you know, get out your pillow or something in your bedroom and really start punching into it and yelling and screaming and F you and whatever else. Connect to that anger. 
about what you really, really feel. Experience that anger, because it will be a childhood anger that you've locked onto. Experience that and allow yourself to step under into the grief of that. <coughs> allow yourself to do that. So when I'm saying making these lists, I'm not talking about just sitting down intellectually and going, oh yeah, I've got this, oh yeah, I've got that, oh yeah, I've got this, oh yeah, isn't that interesting? <laughs> what I'm saying is, allow yourself to actually place yourself in a position where you're touching your own body and feeling it and starting to feel a sexual response. And then allow the feelings to come up. That's the list. Allow the feelings to come up and experience the feelings that are coming up. And keep doing it until those feelings no longer exist within you. Now that's going to be quite confronting, right? For most people that will be confronting. Now there's lots of books written about that subject. My suggestion is to read them. But usually when we have these emotions, we don't want to read those kind of books because we find them disgusting. So you can see how most of the time we are still trying to avoid the unpleasant emotional experience. My suggestion is stop avoiding unpleasant emotional experiences. If it's within you, feel it, whether it's unpleasant or not. Choose, remember what humility is? The desire, the passionate desire for all of your own emotion. That's what humility is. So be humble and let yourself experience it. Now, um, I said to her as well, if I can, or well, Mary might like to read some of it. As long as they haven't got names in it. I don't think no. it yeah. um, You suggest doing some work on what messages you got, particularly from your own mother and other women when you were a child, about your sexual parts. Uh, think about when you were shut down from talking about touching, hearing, looking at your own sexual organs. <coughs> what non-verbal messages and implications were received about these messages, about these matters from your mother in particular. <coughs> Look at how your mother reacted to romance and touch inside her marriage when you were little. Also look at how your father reacted to sexual discussion regarding the female or whether he even felt open enough to discuss these issues in front of his children. Uh, so you can see all the personal shame stuff, so shame about my own body, has to have come from my environment because you are not born with personal shame about your own body. Right? If you look at a lot of children, they walk around naked, and who cares? You know? They walk around touching themselves, who cares? They don't have any personal shame about it. It's only when we project that shame, then they start feeling that shame. They start feeling shut down. So all issues of personal shame about my own body had to have come from somewhere in my very young formative years. Usually it comes from our parents, and usually it's that same shame is within our parents in some way. Now, for many women, it's there, but also there's projections from men, where men uh, feel they can't raise the issue with their woman. So, so many men stop talking about sex, for example, because every time they try, maybe the woman shut them down. So there's often feelings in the, inside the male as well that start generating that you're not allowed to be sexual, you're not allowed to be open mm -hmm. about sex, and all those kind of things. So whether you're a male or female, you can do these things. So if the desire, start with the desire, if the desire is there for intimacy, go with the desire for intimacy. When the sex issue comes up and the fear kicks in, so it's just fear, the other thing <coughs> is that many of us, even with other emotions, not sexual emotions, but other emotions, many of us are still living in our fear. Do you know what I mean by living in it rather than experiencing it and releasing it? Living in it is when you live by it. Right? Experiencing it means you will go through this trembling and shaking and feelings and you will actually connect with all of these different feelings and you will really connect with them. That's now experiencing it. There's a big difference between those two states. Most of us avoid the experience of it and so in avoidance of the experience we live in it constantly. And our fear then dictates to us our lives. So the problem with sexual stuff is that your fear will continue to dictate your life and because we're afraid of the sex or we, we have issues with the sex, we will think that's a good thing. But it's actually not a good thing for us, nor is it a good thing for our connection with God because we're detuning ourselves from a large part of ourselves inside which detunes ourselves from God as well. And in the end, like I say, you cannot be at one with God in that state. 
where you've detuned from yourself. So it's really important to allow yourself to start really challenging yourself on a physical level which will challenge your emotions by doing, actually doing things with your own body that you will have aversion to doing right at the beginning. And that's a really important process to actually go through. It's the process that you weren't allowed to experience when you were little. You were prevented from experiencing when you were little. And if you think about it, if you watch a child during its sexual development, a child has no issues about experimenting with its own body. A child also has no issues with experimenting without other children's body either. We have issues with it, lots of issues with it. But a child has no issues with that. To a child, it's just a wondrous thing. So what we need to do is rediscover that by actually going through that process that we weren't allowed to do when we were children. Now that might take quite some time. And every time some fear will be released. If it's fear, if you're not shaking in fear, then you're not experiencing it. You're just living in it. Maybe, do you mind mentioning the experience last night? A little bit too close to home at the moment. We'll maybe talk about another experience later that Mary's had re very recently, last night actually, while we were staying with Brian. Um, but the issue is, like, Mary was experiencing fear to do with sexual things and just shaking and, and trying to get away from it. Her whole body was responding. Right? Let yourself do that. I've had whole periods of time in fear where I've been shaking and trembling and... My, and sometimes people around me have said that sometimes my whole body looked like it was vibrating off the ground. I was laying on the ground and just experiencing fear and just letting myself experience it. And, and I was with other people who were quite challenged by it, but I still allowed myself to experience it. So let yourself experience it. There was a time in my life where everyone around me, I was 33 years old, and everyone around me thought I had Parkinson's because I was shaking so much. So I was shaking like this all the time. Everything, everything would shake. That's how much fear was in me. It just, and, it, and then after a period of time of releasing that fear, physically releasing it, it all just disappeared. So it's a matter of allowing yourself to release this emotion. So allow the desire, but allow the fear. Allow the fear, allow the anger. Allow the anger, do it all in a physical way. With regard to sexuality, start triggering yourself sexually. You can do that. You have control of that. Nobody else has control of your body but you. You can do that. You can give yourself the time, make the time available. You can even do it on a daily basis to work through these issues. Pray to God about that issue, specifically about that issue. Every time you sit down to do it, pray to God beforehand. I want to connect with what emotions are causing me to disconnect with my body. What emotions are causing me to disconnect from my own sexuality? I want to confront those emotions. Ask God about bringing you even law of attraction events that cause you to confront those emotions. Notice the books that come into your life. Read them. Because there'll be something in them for you about that particular issue. Allow yourself to confront them. Does that make sense? Does anyone want to ask some questions surrounding Joshua? Thanks. Um, is there a mic? Sorry, I'm sorry, I know you're right. Sorry, I was just wondering, with the fear stuff, um, it, like when you were doing that fear stuff, was there something that around you that was making you afraid, or were you mentalizing what you were afraid of? And like, because it almost feels like the only thing I can do to go through the fear is, you know, go up to my dad and say I'm, I'm listening to Jesus every week. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, like, and I don't want to do that. I suppose that, I suppose that could work. But, uh, is, that the only, is that the only way? <laughs> I made a conscious choice to do everything I was afraid of. So, like, I was petrified to even walk into a shopping centre at one stage in my life. And this was, again, around 33 years of age. But the way I would treat a shopping centre was I would drive up to the shopping centre with my wife and my children in the car, I'd park in the car, sit in the car, and wait for them to go shopping, and then they'd come back, and then I'd take them home. And the reason why is I was just petrified to go into the shopping centre. 
And so what happened was I, I decided to do two visits a week to a shopping centre for no reason other than to sit in the shopping centre. And I did that for three hours every time, two times a week, until I confronted the emotion. And the emotion, after a while I worked out, the emotion was I was, I was tired of being looked at by everybody. I couldn't cope with being looked at by everybody. I had these really big emotions about people looking at me all the time. And I went through that emotion. And when I got through that emotion, I could walk in a shopping centre and be fine. I then uh, had a problem with walking up to a shop assistant and asking them for help. So what I did then was I would choose something to buy one week, one thing. <laughs> go into the shopping centre and walk, go into every shop that, I, that had that particular thing and go up to the shop assistant and ask for their help. And then let myself feel the emotions that are coming up. Now, as I did all of that, what happened was that just caused me to get into this state where I could feel my terror. And what eventually happened was every single morning I woke up in a terrified state and I went into this... Uh, um, my, my body, my entire body went into a cramp is the best way to explain it. And it would last anywhere up to two hours. And in a few times I had to be hospitalised because of it. So over a period of, of three months, that happened twice a day for nearly three months. Uh, I don't know if that's encouraging for people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling you how much terror I have. <laughs> you don't have that much terror, but this is how much terror I have. And so what I did, and I, all I did was concentrate on breathing, just breathing diaphragmatically all through that process. So in the process of confronting my life, everything I was afraid of, that brought up me, that got me into this emotional state where I started confronting the terror naturally every single day. And as I released that terror, my life changed markedly. So over that three month period, it started, I was in these fit, what we call fear fits, I call now, for, for a couple of hours in terrible pain, just, just managing to breathe. A few times I passed out and was taken to hospital, but most of the time I stayed in them. And, and I just allowed that to occur, allowed that to occur, until it was done and then a lot of times I slept nearly 48 hours after that because it was so exhausting on my body and I just allowed myself to sleep for 48 hours as well and then um, and then as that occurred as that lessened as these fear releases occurred it all lessened and by three months later they took five minutes and so in five minutes it was over and then after that shortly after that I had none after that ever again so the key is to actually allow yourself to go into the experience. Do you know what I mean? We all have like a belief like if you walk up to the edge of a cliff, we have fear it keeps us safe, you know? Does that mean that once we work through all our fears we're not gonna have those fears of that are supposed to keep us safe, you know? Like No, yeah, that's right. You will not have those fears. So so like I don't purposefully touch a hot stove because I know it's hot and I'll get burned. Does that make sense? But, but isn't that what teaches us in the first place to, to be afraid of those things? Like when we're young, like you touch a hot stove and it's like, oh, and then you learn to be afraid of that. Too. Yeah, but that's the that's the learning by experience rather than learning by being taught. And what I've what I've come to feel now, and while I would agree with that statement before, now what I actually feel is that that everything comes to me through my law of attraction, just to trigger emotions. So once I've released all emotions, for example. Even if I touch something hot, I won't get burnt. Right. Even if I hold a snake, I'm not going to get bitten. There's actually reference to this in the Bible, by the way. Um, if, I, if I hold a snake, I won't get bit because I've released the emotion that would cause that snake to bite me. Does that make sense? So we can face everything we're afraid of, basically. Everything. There is no fear in love, in perfected love. No fear in perfected love at all. You're not afraid of what will happen to your children, you're not afraid of what will happen to you, you're not afraid of what of death, you're not afraid of pain, you're not afraid of anything. I just don't understand how we're going to get this all done in time. <laughs> well, as, as you receive divine love, your soul changes so rapidly that all of these emotions get confronted. All you need to do is allow the emotion. As you allow the emotion, you'll get into new states. Another example. I was on, I think I've told this before, but I was on a massage table getting triggered with deep tissue massage. I did three sessions, uh, sorry, altogether six sessions, but they were the last three sessions I was doing. And Ange was there, it was in Dallas, 
I was having these massages, coming away all bruised, right? And going through these terrible experiences, having massage and screaming and crying and everything. And then the very last one that I had, I just went through this barrier. And the woman was doing exactly the same thing, right? And I felt pleasure instead of screaming. And when I say I was screaming, I was screaming, like crying and screaming in the pain, in the pain of it. And I went through that barrier into this place where I was no longer screaming and crying. And it felt pleasurable, actually. It was tingling sensations on my body. And she was doing exactly the same thing. So what happened, what I realized in that moment was I just released all my fear about that pain. And in the process of releasing the fear, the pain automatically just disappeared. And this is what will happen to you through this process. As you receive more divine love, there's less fear. As there's less fear, and you allow yourself to confront your fear and feel your fear and release it, what will happen in the end is that you'll get to a place where there is no pain either. Because it's fear that creates pain. So it's only fear that creates pain. So let's look at this sexually. If, if as a woman you've got pain in your vagina, you're afraid about something going on in there. What is it? You need to ask yourself what it is. Does that make sense? If you've got pain in your abdomen, you've got issues with regard to being afraid about something about that. There's a fright, and you're always afraid of an emotion in the end. So allow yourself to feel that. And these things can happen so rapidly, Joshua. It's like, you know, you can have one experience and the next day be totally different. Does it feel like you, you like, I keep having this thing coming to my head, like, we've got to go to hell to get to heaven. You've got to go through hell to get to heaven. That's what it feels like. The truth is that most of us are already in hell. That's the problem. And yes, you have to experience being where you are before you're going to get to where you want to be. So the very truth is that most of us are in denial about where we are. And that's what the issue is. That's the problem. If we weren't in denial of where we are, and we knew exactly where we are, we'd already be experiencing the emotion. And ironically, we'd be releasing it and being in a new place automatically. But God reliance is a big part of that as well. If we become God reliant, then the process isn't as painful. Yeah. So I found in before, and all these fear things that I'm discussing, by the way, about myself, they all happened before I became God reliant. So, so the three months of dealing with it that way was because I was self reliant, not asking God for assistance. Is that why it was so hard and took longer? Yeah, yeah, hard and very long, and uh, and took a lot out of me as well emotionally to do it. But you don't have to do that because you've got God there, and God can, when you allow emotions to flow, God can just reach in and call, pull out the causal. But, but He can't do that if you don't allow the emotions to flow. Now, last weekend you experienced that feeling. You remember when you had that that emotional release in the group last week? Remember the feeling straight after that you felt after the group? Yeah, I also felt like calm. Exactly. So you actually had released a causal emotion and within a half an hour after you'd finished releasing it, you felt this beautiful sense of peace and calm. And fresh. And fresh and, and quite happy, if you remember too. You were quite like changed in that moment. And that's what it will be like when you do it with God. and I mentioned um, sex toys and um, I guess I've had a bit of a block whenever it comes to things like that and <coughs> I've always been confronted and asked um, to have them in my sexual relationship Interesting. With my yeah. and I've always said no I don't want that and it's the same with um, anal sex and I just want to know whether, is that, am I saying no because I personally don't feel like I need to go further with that in my sex life, or do I fear it and should I be doing it to see how much fear comes up? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good, very good question. Very good question. <laughs> 
brave lady facing her fear? No, that's a very good question. Um, there's two facets to the question. On one side, um, you will have desires that won't match another person's desires. And, and if that occurs, and the other person is pestering you to have the same desire, that is your law of attraction. So let's say there's two people. So again, there's two people here. One, yourself. You're feeling afraid of sex toys. He's wanting sex toys. Can you see that perhaps he's wanting sex toys because you're afraid of them? Can you see that might be the law of attraction? Right? You're afraid of anal sex? He wants it. Can you see that maybe he wants it because you're afraid of it? Can you see that might again be your law of attraction? I'm not so much afraid or I don't feel like I'm afraid. I feel like um, that it's not a natural thing for me to do. I don't feel that it's natural. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a good question though. Like, um, I can't. My personal feelings are I can't answer that as to whether it's natural or not. Like, why would, why would we have a problem with any part of our body being touched? Like, with regard to if we're receiving or giving love, why would there, like, you, do you have the same problem with your breast being touched? Or do you have the same problem with your underarm being touched? Because that's not a sexual place either, well, that's what it feels. So there's obviously, there must be some kind of fear associated with it as well. I just feel like, um you know, I'm at a certain stage in my... Can I, can I ask you, has it ever happened? No. Okay. So how do you know that you don't like it? I feel like I've come to a point... Yep. Um, and I have done for a while where I feel quite satisfied with my sex life and I don't feel like I need to explore that further and that's what I feel that those... That, that's why he's projecting this at you. Because the truth is that there is some deep fears in you about your sex life. That's why you're satisfied with it being as it is currently. What will happen if you're on the divine path is your sex life will grow as your soul expands. So you will have, you, all of you have as a prospect before you that your sex life and your intensity of sexual relationship will continue to grow, 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 grow. Because your soul is going to continue to grow, 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 grow. Because as you receive divine love, it transforms your soul in all these different areas, including in the sexual area. You follow me? So if you're satisfied to be in a place without growth, that in itself is an emotional injury. So you need to look deeply at what would be the underlying reasons. And for many people, it's an issue of vulnerability and openness. And I feel that for yourself, it's about <coughs> being fully open and vulnerable to a male in particular. You've heard that song uh, by Bruce Springsteen called Secret Garden? How many of you have heard that song? He talks about um, she will let you into her uh, house, she will let you into her, well, whatever he mentions, I, I, I'm not the poet. <laughs> and so, and then he says, but into her, se into her secret garden, don't think twice. In other words, for many women, and many men, by the way, it's not just a women thing, we don't let the opposite gender into our secret garden, the place which is where we are. Right? And it's, it's the process of opening up enough emotionally to do that that's going to cause us also to have a stronger and stronger desire for a sexually intimate relationship greater than what we have. So bear in mind that I'm not saying do these things. I am saying look at your fear about them and the fact that you have never done them, but are, are not wanting to, and, don't, and the fact that he's actually asking you to, is your law of attraction to deal with some sexual issues. So allow yourself to be confronted with these sexual issues, but make sure it's in a loving environment. So if he's going to abuse you with sex toys, 
and you're not feeling comfortable and you're not allowed to experience your emotions, then that's not right either. Allow yourself to go through the process emotionally. Does that make sense? As does he need to. He needs to look at why does he want you to do something that you don't want to do. He needs to look at that too. He needs to look at that emotionally. But if we're just dealing with your law of attraction, this is your law of attraction, allow it to trigger whatever emotions are inside of you. Does that make sense? Let yourself deal with them. So, let yourself deal with these particular things you're afraid of. At some point, you will not be afraid of anything, including a sex toy. Right? You may, that may not mean that you use it, but you're just not afraid of it. It doesn't stress you out. It doesn't, you don't have any feelings about it in any way. It's not something that you would, you know, would be afraid of trying, for example. Do you follow me? Now, personally, I don't feel drawn to trying a sex toy myself. That's my personal feelings. But the question I've got to ask myself, is it because I'm afraid? Because as soon as I'm afraid, then I'm not harmonious with love, and I need to start looking at that seriously. I've actually thought that maybe there's something wrong with me because I don't want to do those things, and that's why I'm... Well, that might be the emotion that you need to actually feel. The fact that you feel that sexually there might be something wrong with you. Does that make sense? That might be the only emotion he's actually transmitting to you, that there is something wrong with you sexually. The truth is, though, you will continue to expand sexually as you grow in your relationship with God continuously. So if you're wanting to remain stagnant, then question it. There's a desire for stagnation. If there's a desire for stagnation, I'm satisfied with what I have, I don't want any more, then there is also a limitation. In other words, you cannot expand infinitely while you have this, in, in, this limitation. So allow yourself to experiment with why you have that limitation placed on yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it would still be then a personal choice whether you choose to do that, though, wouldn't it? Of course, that's everything. Your way of going. But don't use that to justify the fear. No. See, what you're doing at the moment is using that to justify the fear. <coughs> Even if you imagine, just to use your imagination to deal with this issue is obviously it's quite threatening. Initially, feel how you feel. Like if you imagine yourself in those situations or using those things, what's the feeling inside of you? I feel dirty. Yeah, that's what you've got to feel. That's it. Yeah. Can you see, and that's also linked to why you don't want the sex to change at this point, because you might feel dirty. So that's a core emotion from childhood. I'm just thinking um, God didn't make these sex toys and they sort of made by uh, men or women who've got uh, emotions to, to cause them to make them in the first place so that's why I'm thinking it's sort of unloving by God because he didn't make these Yeah, I've things. got a good sex toy <laughs> <laughs> in my pants, right? And I feel that she has got pretty good sex toys already <laughs> So my personal feeling is I'm pretty happy with that. But, but, but my, the issue is the fear. And the fear is the issue, emotion of feeling dirty. And the emotion of feeling dirty is creating this resistance to deepening your sexual relationship, which means that you're resistive to change in your sexual relationship. That's what the man you're with is feeling from you, and that's why he's confronting you with these things. Can you see that? So while in the end you may come to terms and say, oh, no, I love my own sex toys and, and don't need another, right? You won't be afraid of them and you certainly want to deepen your relationship rather than, rather than just keep it as it is. Um, she, oh, he said, well, somebody up the back was at their hand up. It was, it was you, wasn't it, Sam? Yeah, go on, go for it. Just put it close to your mic. To, to yeah. your mouth, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just on the topic of masturbation with children. Yep. Um, I feel we've already given our kids some fairly um, straightforward ideas on that topic. Yeah. Um, obviously, we need to change some things in that area. Yep. If we do that, um, 
do you still need to say something to the children to say, look, sorry, we said that to you, or will they just still make you process themselves? Yeah, what would happen if you have children? Let's say you're a parent and you've projected out your child not to masturbate in front of you. And you've projected out your child that it's not quite right, they need to either do it in private or not do it at all, perhaps, is what some parents project. What you need to do now is re go back to those situations and feel your emotion that you felt about it. And probably what there'll be is some emotions of shame about something in your own childhood where you masturbated and was exposed and it caused lots of different problems around you, right? So you have a deep shame about it. Let yourself feel that shame and guilt. Now, as you feel that shame and release it, what will happen is your children will naturally start masturbating again and you won't have to say anything to them and it won't bother you. Does that make sense? What is, why is the urge to constantly have sex with love and intensity with your partner at the beginning of a relationship, but it fades over time? The urge to have sex every night of your life just disappears. How many feels that with their relationships? <laughs> oh, this is what's happened. It starts really with a bang and then ends with a whimper. <laughs> All right. With a bang, literally. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, and we've already covered that a little, haven't we, today? But, but let's go a bit, a bit deeper into the issue because it's important. When we first meet a person, remember all of our chakras open at a certain level because of the law of attraction operating. So law of attraction operating, my injury, their injury, and so forth. And so we feel this strong desire. Now, remember that almost every relationship on earth begins this way. There's hardly any relationship on earth that begins in a pure way in the sense that both are just in desire, both are soulmates and they just meet and everything's happy ever after, right? No, that very rarely occurs, right? So what happens is the two meet and they're meeting and being drawn together by injuries, of which some of them, of course, are sexual. But even the ones that aren't sexual, if the injuries are compatible, they will cause a flow of energy through you, which will result in sexual arousal in many cases. So this is what's happening. So right at the beginning, that's quite intense. Right? But then as time goes on, right, you start working through some of those injuries for a start because that's why you've been drawn together. And then on top of that, you start seeing the flaws in the other person. And that detunes desire, and so the desire starts waning. You see more flaws, and that detunes desire even further. Both of you are looking at each other instead of looking at yourself and dealing with your emotions generally. And so it gets to a point where, wow, well, it was great at the beginning, but now I'm just tired of this whole thing. Now, if we tune into ourselves emotionally, it will happen quite differently. What will happen if we tune into emotionally is that we'll see all of these events as our law of attraction. And what we'll do is we'll start connecting at the law of attraction level to our own soul. We'll start feeling what's going through us. So recognizing, for example, oh, I was attracted to that girl because I could look after her. And the more I had to look after her, the more tired I became of looking after her, which is my law of attraction, to expose this emotion of me wanting to look after women. So I need to go into that emotionally. How does this feel, having to look after a woman and yet not seem to get much back? So this is something, one of the questions I had to ask myself. Once I go into those things emotionally and release those emotions, one of two things will happen. My partner will look at the emotions of why she wants to be looked after, or she will naturally want to leave. That's the two things that will happen. Right? And so as I grow, I may have a different partner in time. And that's something I need to come to accept. <coughs> that if a relationship wanes, that probably at the beginning what was happening was that there were emotional injuries that were part of the attraction <coughs> and that those emotional injuries are waning in their power and therefore the draw of the two of us together is much less strong. Can I add to that? Mm. Um, also, I think sometimes it's when two people come together, there's a desire, but it's mixed with need, which is similar to what you're saying. But sometimes then once we get all cosy and get a house, and some of the needs perhaps of the woman were, I want to feel loved and secure and safe, 
And so all of those needs are being met in other areas of the relationship. So the sex suddenly is not as an important uh, ingredient, ingredient mm -hmm. in the relationship. So I think the point is sex in a healthy relationship is always present. So if it's not there, then there's something else uh, going on. Mm. And sex in a normal relationship, actually in, a, in a, a relationship that continues to grow, the sex will continue to grow. It won't actually be stagnant. It will continue to intensify in its experience. So if it's not, look at the emotional barriers you yourself have to that occurring. And usually it's issues of vulnerability, openness, honesty, truthfulness, and lots of other issues like that all have impact upon your sexual feelings. Next question. Yep. Um, this one's from a lady later in life who says, our libidos do change as we get older. Can I stop there? <laughs> no, that's not true. It is a fact of life in our current environment because of the emotions that we continue to hold on to but don't release. And as we, re we don't release more and more of this built up emotion, our libido or our sexual desire naturally decreases. But that does not have to occur. And therefore, libido does not have to drop as you get older. But then, let's continue. Yeah, because the next statement is when the hormones change their action on our psyches, we need to find more ins find inspiration in other ways, it would seem. So that's so. another error too. The truth is that our hormones are affected by our emotions. So the reason why our hormones get suppressed, and remember that hormones do actually produce different sexual desires or libido, but as our hormones, our hormones get suppressed because of the emotions that we're suppressing, usually regarding intergender is emotional issues. Right? So if you find, you find you don't have the same amount of hormones that you're having before going through menopause and so forth, it's due to the intergender emotional damage that we all have, men and women, by the way, have, that affect these things. So, once penetration is attained, the body and the emotional body has an aha moment, and then it's fun. Getting to that point can be challenging, as the, be as the libido is what makes it all happen in the first place. So, are there any suggestions? Now, it's very important that many times your questions will tell you your answers. And this is in one case. Once penetration is attained, the body and the emotional body has an aha moment, then it's fun. That's the issue here. The issue is there's an emotion that hasn't been dealt with in the person who has this issue, and, and the, the act of penetration is causing them actually fear-based distress. And so, <laughs> no, I don't feel the aha is a good aha. It's just a recognition aha. Is that right? No, and then it's fun. And then um, it's fun. I think the aha is it's all good now. Do you think? Yeah. yeah. Is the person who asked the question think? <laughs> because the per the feeling I get from the person who asked the question is that it was sort of like an aha moment in the sense of this is happening now. This is happening now. Uh, now it's going to be fun. Oh. Like there's this recognition that something's going on there. That's the feeling I have from them. So, so I'm going to go with that. <laughs> and that's the answer to the problem as well. And that is that the, the actual physical act of penetration is causing distress. And therefore, there is some emotion associated with penetration from a penis into the vagina. There's some emotions actually involved in that process so, in that process. So there's a resistance until that happens and then when it happens. Then it happens when it happens, now there's no resistance. Now the person is starting to feel that it's fun. Alright? Now the truth is there's an emotion driving that 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 place of trying to resist um, penetration. And so there's some very deep emotions that need to be looked at regarding penetration that would be related to childhood issues, shame of the body, and all sorts of other issues relating to those things. Look at them, allow yourself to experience them. Can there also be like a dread of the act? Yes. And like the lead up and, oh, is it going to happen? And, and then once it's happening, oh, okay. How many feel that? Like, you're sort of almost dreading getting involved with the sex act, and then all of a sudden you get involved in, oh, it's all right now, we can proceed. 
a lot of people feel that at times. So allow yourself to feel what's underneath that. So emotion. yeah, that might be about the expectations of me as a woman to actually provide sex and what does that mean? That yeah. dread might be related. Yeah, it. totally. Does that make sense? Not to most of you. Most of you have thought, ah, ah, man. Oh, you beauty, this is going on. But if that was the case, the libido would already be high. Because if you like, if you really want sex, would you have a problem with libido? So there must be something going on emotionally that causes us to have a resistance at the libido level. And that's always an emotion. Uh, next one. Uh, something that I notice happens to me often, that when I'm intimate with someone and it comes to penetration or orgasm, I start to burst out crying. These emotions are very different, sometimes just joy, but often also emptiness, deep sadness. Uh, I'm wondering, is it only my emotions getting triggered, or is there, through intercourse, a meeting connection with the other soul happening, and it could be his emotions? It's always your emotions. <laughs> so, if you're a lady and you're being penetrated and at the time of penetration or at the time of orgasm or afterwards you cry, it is because of some causal emotion regarding deep grief and sadness and in her case she felt that sort of hollow, empty feeling afterwards and that is a feeling of nothing, that I am nothing and you need to allow yourself to experience those emotions. When you release them at the causal level, you will no longer have them. So even if it takes like, if for three months you cry after every time, that's fine. Allow yourself to do that. Don't worry about the guy getting stressed out about that. You know, that's his issue. He needs to feel about that. Allow yourself just to cry, allow yourself to release it. A lot of these emotions entered you before you even had a conscious recollection of yourself. In other words, before the age of one and a half or two, a lot of these emotions had already entered you. And so you're not going to have recollections, intellectual recollections of what the causal, that what the event was that caused that emotion. Allow yourself to experience it. And can I say that's been really powerful for me to just go with whatever emotion comes up. During, and so sometimes I cry and sometimes, and if you have a partner who's really sensitive to that, you can actually, uh, and if you yourself open up to, okay, what is my emotional experience during sex, then I found a lot more started coming up and we could experiment with that and AJ is very sensitive to stopping and starting and that kind of thing. But um, lots of deep um, sexual beliefs or feelings that I have had about myself have come up through that process. Yeah. So um, we may be having sex together and then Mary all of a sudden just starts crying. And so we just we just stop at the process there and then and just allow the tears to complete. And then sometimes afterwards Mary says, I want to continue now, so we continue, you know? And sometimes she feels like, no, there's a lot more here and I just can't do it anymore, and that's fine too. So there's no problems with me with that. Um, and we were talking to some people in the break about um, something similar when I was saying to Jen about um, sex really being a giving act. And something that's been really powerful for us um, is to not get caught up on the climax and what you're going to get and who's going to get there. And, but if you're just in that space together of giving, it's quite a different space uh, emotionally. Mm. It's quite beautiful. Yeah, so when you start actually concentrating and focusing just on the giving, what happens is the energy that flows through from you to the other person heightens their sexual response. And then if they are focused on giving to you, that emotional energy cycles again through you, heightened or amplified. And so you get this response, and, I can, and we both feel it as, as we do it. Now, as soon as one of us has an emotional reaction, we find that energy flow just stops. Bam, it just stops there. And, and straight away in me, there's a, there's a response to that of obviously of no longer having erection. And straight away, you know, we know there's an emotional issue that needs to be sorted out. And so we sort through that emotional issue. It might take a day or two days a week or even to sort through that issue. And then what happens next time we make love, that cycle, you can feel the cycle happening. So we're very becoming more and more sensitive to that amplification of sexual energy flowing through you. 
The sexual energy will not flow through you unimpeded because you've got emotional barriers, right? Um, and, and the key is to allow the emotional barriers to be released and then as those emotional barriers are released, the sexual energy flows through you in a more and more unimpeded manner. Eventually you'll get to the stage where it just flows through you both constantly, <coughs> which is a beautiful place to be, obviously. Any questions about that? Mm -hmm. Nah. <laughs> um, How about this one? Okay. I stopped sleeping with my husband due to his drinking alcohol and impotence. After drinking, he became a different person, belligerent, and I believe now that other spirits were attached to him. Okay. Um, husband? Spirits? Attached to him? Why? Wife stops sleeping with the husband? Why are you even in the relationship? Is my question. All right? You are staying in the relationship because of security issues, obviously, because you're, firstly, you're not addressing this issue that you have with your husband. Your husband gets drunk, you know he's getting drunk, and you know his spirits are influencing him, that's all fine. He's impotent, which means he's very, very angry with women and not wanting to do that. The fact that he's drunk, also, or drunk, drunk it also probably means that he's probably not going to deal with that for some time. Are you being loved? Yes or no? No. You are not being loved. There's no love coming at you. Why do you want to stay in a relationship where there's no love? That's the real question. Do you see what I'm saying? No. Why stay in a relationship where there's no love? Because I feel like I don't want love in my life. That's why you've got a law of attraction thing going on with regard to being loved. He's got some anger issues and he's got lots of issues, but I can't address his issues because he hasn't asked the question. You've asked the question. The question is regarding you've stopped sleeping with him. Why have you stopped, stopped sleeping with him? Have you talked to him? Well, I'm assuming that you have. If you've talked to him and he doesn't want to change, why are you still here? And the only reason I can see that why you would still there be there is because of security. There's something else you're getting from this relationship other than love that you badly want and you're willing to be put, put up with being unloved to get it. Does that make sense? Everyone? Yeah. So with all relationship issues, look really, really seriously at why you're putting up with long-term issues. There's an issue in you that causes you to put up with a long-term issue. Not in the other person. Quite often I have women coming to me quite often saying, oh, my husband gets drunk all the time, what should I do? How long has this been happening? 30 years. <laughs> what should I do? And then I ask them often, what have you already done? Oh, well, I've talked to him about this and I've talked to him about that and we often scream about it and we often fight about it. But they don't get the message. The message is they're not being loved and they want to stay. Why do they want that? That's what's coming at them. They need to learn something about love in that transaction. It's got nothing to do with the guy. When they learn that lesson in love, this guy may change, but he may not either. And you'll attract another guy who does love you. So look at the issue of security. For many people, security, it drives all of their sexual desire. The feeling of wanting to be safe that drives many people's sexual desire. The feeling of wanting to feel secure, safe, nurtured. That's because you don't feel secure, you feel unsafe and unnurtured. Let yourself release those emotions, then you will feel safe, secure and nurtured without having a person in your life. And ironically, you'll attract the person who you feel safe, secure and nurtured with as well. Is that okay? Okay. The next one's from an older gentleman who's having some issues with uh, achieving an erection. He loves his wife and he asks, is oral sex and masturbation okay? Alright. Firstly, trouble with obtaining an erection, remember I said was related to intergender issues, firstly created by anger, but obviously underneath that some deep grief. So look really sincerely at the feelings you have towards the opposite sex. 
the fact that you can't obtain an erection, there is actually feelings that you are having towards the opposite sex, sex that you are not intellectually allowing yourself to see. And is it fair to say that it may not, because um, I know I've had this issue of having a lot of anger at men, but I'm not angry at AJ, but in fact it affects my orgasm. But So it, I had to be very honest about it. I'm having emotions towards men. Um, even though it's hard to relate that to AJ. But the truth is I'm a man, so those emotions are coming towards me too. Right? So, so if you're gonna, you might have anger issues with previous relationship women. You may have anger issues particularly with maybe your mother or some other key female figure in your childhood. Allow yourself to work through that issue. Then the flag will raise. I think that's the way you ask the question. I can't raise the flag. And then the flag will raise. Right? And, uh, and you'll be right with regard to that. Now, let's look at the issue of oral sex and masturbation. Masturbation is fine, but if, if you're finding that you get turned on masturbating, but you can't raise the flag, as the saying goes, with your partner, then obviously it's quite clear, isn't it, that you don't have problems pleasuring yourself, but you do have problems in the interaction pleasuring your partner. What if they're, they're masturbating their partner? Well, masturbating partner's fine too, isn't it? No, I just wondered if I felt that was a good uh, question. Well, with mutual masturbation or something like that, or, or just pleasuring the woman. Yeah. yeah. If, let's, say, let's say you have problems obtaining an erection if you're a male, and you have problems even with libido as a male, but you do enjoy just pleasuring your wife, right? Or pleasuring your partner. Well, obviously that's fine, but you've got to look at why are you denying them the pleasure of doing the same with you? There's something going on there emotionally. Does that make sense? There's got to be some emotional thing you've got going on with women that would cause you to not want to receive from women but willing to give. Right? So have a look at that particular issue, what's going on inside of you emotionally. Now that's assuming that he's talking about uh, giving oral sex or, mas or, or, or touching his wife. Let's, see if, let's assume it's on the receiving end. In other words, he only gets an erection when he's, when he's engaged in oral sex. If you only get an erection in certain locations or in certain mo uh, situations or in certain fantasies, then there are always emotional reasons why that's the case. And they'll always generally be linked to some kind of childhood events. Um, and they'll often be linked to things like issues of homophobia as well as to what's going on there. So, or uh, working through issues of homophobic situations. So there's a lot of issues that may be associated with you know, why you want to only give pleasure and not receive it, why you only want to receive pleasure and not give it, why you only feel powerful sexually when you're engaged in oral sex but you don't feel powerful when you're engaged in, in penetrative sex. All of these issues have always got emotional injuries associated with them. So allow yourself to feel about what they are. And if you allow yourself to feel about what they are and pray about it, almost in every case I've ever seen, within 10 minutes most people will understand what the cause might be. I've very rarely seen a person sincerely want to know an answer to a cause that doesn't get the answer very rapidly from within themselves. Any questions about that one? Jen, uh, Jess, can we... Sorry, mate. What happens if there's an issue of purity? Perhaps you don't really know whether you're with your soulmate or not. And perhaps you've really made a conviction or a decision You only want to go with God and the right way, right, wanting a better way of putting it. And therefore, there's a, a risk or an investment or a loss, one of those, in going all the way, exploring, finding the answer, and you're blocked up about. So in other words, you feel that 
if you involve yourself experimenting with sex, that you're actually being impure from God's perspective, and therefore you've judged yourself and don't allow yourself to do it. Is that right? Kind of. Yeah. Kind of. So, so, yeah, my answer to that just is that you obviously have some major issues of judgment that God has about sex. So, so my suggestion in that case is to learn about God and how God feels about sex. Now, even your own body tells you a lot about how God feels about sex. For example, both the male and the female can ejaculate or come without experiencing penetration. The whole design of a woman's body is about sex in a lot of ways. Right? So therefore, if we're not connecting to it, we're actually disconnecting from God. So all of this viewpoint that's around nowadays of spirituality where, where you, know, you, have to, you have to be pure and you're not allowed to be sexual in order to connect to God is all a lot of hogwash. How, why would God create your sexual organs and then say, Oh, if you want to connect with me, you can't use them. <laughs> <laughs> but what about connecting to the other person? Same applies. Like, in the end, if you've attracted this person into your life, there's a, you've attracted them into it for a reason. It doesn't have to be sexual. If you don't feel that they're your soulmate, you can still work through a lot of sexual inter injuries by yourself by just looking at the attraction that you have without acting upon the attraction. So you don't... If you feel they're your soulmate, then go for it. If it turns out that a week later you realise, oh, they're not my soulmate, then you've at least worked through some emotional injuries regarding the issue. Intention, it's about intention. If you, if you, go, if you go into sex or a sexual relationship with a pure intention, like if there's love and if you feel this person may be your soulmate, then you, it's far less damaging for your soul. If, if you were just to hold off and not have a sexual relationship until you were almost at one with God and you attracted your soulmate, well, it could get really tiring. You'd have to do things fairly a long way around, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you worked through a lot of emotions in your previous relationships that got you to a point. Like, you reached a point where you no, felt... No, sorry. Oh. What, what happened with me was that I did realise that I had a lot of injuries with women, right? So what I did is I allowed the law of attraction to bring women into my life that I didn't have a sexual relationship with, but I still allowed myself to work through those emotional injuries with them. Does that make sense? Like, so, so. But say, for, say, Jen and Graham. Yep. They feel that they're soulmates. They, like you suggest, they should hold off on having a sexual relationship until they're sure. No, but if you feel your soulmates, I'm saying the opposite of that. Like, that's what I was saying. Yeah. If, you, if your intention is pure and you feel that that's your soulmate, why would you hold on? Yeah, I agree with that. But don't, but don't say to yourself, oh, I know they're not my soulmate, so I can't have a sexual relationship with them. That's not true either. You can, if you desire it, if it's based on love, you can have. But look at what it's going to bring you. But my feelings are, if you know a person's not your soulmate and you're wanting a sexual relationship with them, there's an emotional injury driving that. So you deal with it. Like, let yourself feel the emotional injury. What is it, if you know? If you know for certain, I'm saying. Most people don't know for certain, for a start, but if you knew for certain. Yeah, well, Mary, Mary isn't a strong, Mary's got this emotional injury, if I can say, about soulmates. She just, uh, She's disappointed with it. <laughs> no, I'm not, no. But I... I... <laughs> no, but you have... You have but I feelings. can't know for certain right now, and so... You have feelings about the soulmate relationship that, allow, that don't allow you to be vulnerable to the soulmate relationship. That, that's a probably accurate way of saying it. Yes. So I could choose to not have a relationship with you yes. and work through that issue, but yes. I feel that would be quite laborious because I'm far more triggered by just having the relationship with you and triggering the emotions about vulnerability. Yes. Which is what, yeah. Yeah. So in that case, I agree. Okay, so the real issue is here, not about me. It's about Graham, and I just asked his permission. <laughs> <laughs> So, Graham, can, can I ask you, Graham, why you didn't ask the question? 
um, because I don't quite feel that way. Well, the, I, when she asked that question, when she asked that question, I knew that she was asking it about me. Um, but it doesn't quite feel that way for me. Why does it feel for you? By the way, you don't even have to involve yourself in this interaction. Um, this, I might have to digress a bit here, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Um, I've had this recurring um, sexual fantasy. Yep. Um, and it's, I call it club penis. And it's about club penis. Go on. Yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> and in it, I'm a I'm a naked waiter in, in a like club for women. Okay, awesome. And then, and then, and it, we don't mind me writing some of this down. <laughs> In a club for women. Yeah. With your hands, silly. Oh, here you go. It's not making fun of you. This is a great fantasy. This is a great fantasy. You've got to allow fantasy, so that's how Remember, allow fantasies, by the way. I don't say, I mean verbalise them, not just keep them in your own mind but actually say them because there's a lot in them. There's a lot emotional in a, fan, in a sexual fantasy, so go on. So, um, in that, I am, it's, it's a situation where women are allowed to fondle the waiters. <laughs> and, and, you know, the waiter might end up lying on the table and the women could end up eating off their bodies and all sorts of things. Uh, okay. Okay. So it's occurred to me just now, just today mm -hmm. that that is like I'm desiring to be in a powerless situation with, sexually with respect to women. And there's a few things going on, that's one. Yeah. So you, you correctly identify that in a way it's a powerless situation, the women are dominating. Yeah. So if I'm desiring that, yeah. Should I be then doing the opposite and putting myself into a powerful situation sexually? Swell, well, yeah, I agree. What this is, what this fantasy is telling you, the reason why you're getting turned into this fantasy is because um, the women have control and they all want you. <laughs> Does that make sense? They want you. And they're allowed to have you whenever they want, but they want you at least. In the fantasy, yes. Yeah, yeah, they want you. So, so, so. Stop laughing, everyone. It's over. It's a serious business. Um, right. So, so they want you. So, what's that 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 feeling that you're going for? That women want me. What? Right. That I don't feel desired. Yeah. Underneath that is I don't feel desired by women. So this fantasy was actually created by two emotions. A powerless emotion sexually with women and a feeling that women do not want me sexually. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And what this fantasy does is make you feel good and, makes you, and turns you on because it's feeding those emotions. Fantasies are a fantastic way of actually looking at what, what's going on inside of myself emotionally. <coughs> So the emotions you need to experience are I am feeling powerless with women and women don't really want me sexually. They are the emotions you need they to experience. They seem like opposites to the way you've written it there because it seems like the fantasy on desiring being powerless with women. Oh sorry, I've written them the wrong way around. Because if I write them both as what the, the, the addictive emotion is, in your case, the addiction, the, the addiction, addiction sorry, is power, I want to have power with my sexual interactions with women, and the addiction is women want me. Right? They relate, the actual emotion is... No, you like, know, it seems like the fantasy is about, I'm fantasizing about putting myself in a powerless situation. Is it a powerless situation? 
you're one man in amongst a whole club of women. That seems to me to be like you're now the focus of attention. Oh, okay. But maybe it's powerless in that they can do whatever they want with him. Yeah, it's powerless in that sense. But it's quite a powerful situation, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Like. You're one man, you know, all these women, you're naked, they, they can do anything to you, anything they want. That's quite a powerful situation for the man, isn't it? So, isn't it what you're wanting is their desire? Aren't you yeah. wanting their yeah. desire for you? Yeah. yeah. So you do not feel desired by women. Yeah. Okay. This is one reason why you sit back and wait during sex, is because you don't want to initiate because initiate means that they might not desire you. You're going by your desires. Here you're going by their desires. And this is one of the injuries that you're facing is, is allowing yourself to connect to your own sexual desire and actually wanting the woman. Not just waiting for the woman to want you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now I might be wrong in the analysis. Allow yourself to feel the fantasy you allow yourself to look at the construction of the fantasy and then feel the, all I'm saying is feel the emotion underneath the fantasy because it tells you a lot about the injury that's there driving it. So, in terms of what I could do in our relationship, like, should I be aiming for something that's the opposite of the fantasy? Yes. If you aim for the fantasy, you're just fulfilling the addiction, which is, um, you know, whatever the addiction is, that I'm undesirable by women. So, you know, if you walk around naked and she can touch you anywhere you want, that's what you create. And a lot of people, this is what how they live their life. They actually live their life in their sexual fantasies, which is very damaging. It just creates, the emotions never get dealt with that way. So what I'm suggesting... But that's exactly what happens. He walks around naked and I do whatever I like. <laughs> that's not true. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Isn't true? Yeah. He's living in his sexual fantasy but you're not confronting the emotion. The emotion is, I'm allowed to not, do, not, I'm not allowed to do what I want. I'm not allowed to have a desire for them unless they have a desire for me. I don't get turned on unless they're demonstrating a desire for me. Mm, that's always been the case with relationships I've had. They've always had to demonstrate their desire for me before I could feel any arousal. Yep. So why do you think that is, Graham? Sorry? Why, why do you think? Think that is. Does it feel safer that way? I don't know. I don't think about it for a yeah. Mary's Mary's on the board. So it's like there is a safety issue for you in that. Okay. If you were aroused and the woman didn't want you, what would you then feel? I would want to be sure. Yeah, but everyone else identified the emotion. You just identified the action. <laughs> See, everyone else said rejection. You were avoiding rejection. Uh -huh, okay. In this situation, you can't be rejected. Uh -huh. I remember when I first um, started getting interested in girls at school and stuff and going to dances and things. And you know, the proverbial thing of going asking a girl to dance and they say no, looking you up and down and go no, you know, that's a pretty awful sort of thing. That's a pretty big sexual rejection. Yeah, yeah, that, that, those sort of experiences have a pretty powerful effect on But it goes back earlier than that. There must be something happening with your mother to actually have attracted those women. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So look at the issue of rejection. You're avoiding sexual rejection. If you, if you don't exercise your own will, so if, so if, I, don't, if I don't pursue Mary and wait for Mary to pursue me, I'm just avoiding the emotion of what might happen if she rejects me when I pursue her. Yeah. So um, when you talk about my mother, um, I can't quite relate to it all that much. Um, it may be that it, I was so young at the time that I don't quite remember it and she may have changed so that she didn't accept that later. All right, well let's, instead of looking at it intellectually, let's feel it emotionally. The issue you know is, I don't pursue the woman, so you know that's the issue. Yeah. You know the issue probably is to do with this rejection. Yeah. 
So let yourself actually start pursuing her and, and there'll be times when she rejects you and allow yourself to experience the emotion of that rejection. Okay. So should she, like, the way Jen is, she would never reject me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> so what if, so, she loves sex. <laughs> so what will you feel if she never rejects you? What are you feeling now? You, there's another emotion now. What is it? You, you are afraid that if you pursue sex with her, she'll want it every time. So what, what's the problem? Fear. You are afraid. So what's under the fear? Give me a clue. You feel that if, you're, if you want sex and she'll want it every time, after a while, she's going to start... That, that's, going to, that's going to control you. That's what you're afraid of, being controlled. You're afraid of being open and vulnerable to her. Yep. And you look at your past relationships, you can see that every single one has become controlling, pretty much. Yeah, well, it's true that I have a real aversion to being controlled and I'm hypersensitive to it. Yeah. Uh, like I I realised some years ago that I have Asperger's syndrome. Yeah. And you know that's a very introverted sort of thing that people have and I've always been like that all my life. And but it's also that you can't you won't be controlled, you refuse to be controlled. Yeah, there's a deeper emotion in there of feeling claustrophobic. I don't know how to write that. CLAU. Sorry, CLAU. Now we're in a spelling bee. So you're talking about claustrophobic with respect to being controlled? Yeah, you feel claustrophobic in relationships with women because every single time you get to this place where you feel like, oh, I'm being constrained, I'm being controlled. Yeah. Like, I've had this feeling too. Yeah. Right? And and it's an issue with feeling like you're always going to have to give to the woman, always going to have to give to the woman, and eventually you will lose all sense of self. And you've actually said to me in previous conversations that you have lost all sense of self in most <coughs> relationships. Yeah. And this is because, you, and allow yourself to feel this really claustrophobic feeling you have with women. It's related to your mother. So your mother obviously projected lots of emotion at you. She didn't have to do it even in, in a verbal way. She just projects lots of emotion at you and you automatically respond to her. So much so that you've now become a feeling like with women that, uh, you know, oh, it's just claustrophobic being with a woman. It's like constraining, confining. I think control. Like I, could, I, I have some vestiges of memory of when I was really, really young and pushing my mum away. Um, but somewhere along the line she learned a lesson and she stopped doing that. Um, so I don't have much in the way of memories of it. It must have been very, very young when that sort of stuff happened. All you need to do is feel it with Jen, because it's quite often that you're feeling controlled and claustrophobic with Jen. Yeah. So just feel it, go into that emotion. Okay. Yeah. But you also are fear, afraid of rejection as well, sexually. Yep, yeah, definitely. So can you see how even emotions may be even, like, seemingly opposite emotions almost? <coughs> Do you know what I mean? On one hand, I'm afraid of rejection. On the other hand, I'm, I don't want to be controlled. So it's like, you know, but they are all different emotions of injuries that need to be released. Yeah. So should Jen reject me occasionally? See, now you wanting to control Jen's actions, and you're out of line, man. You know what I mean? Okay. She doesn't have to reject you. She loves you. She's allowed to have sex with you whenever she wants, right? Honestly, she's allowed to desire that. So, so no, I'm not going to re say to Jen, oh, I reject him occasionally just to help him with this emotion. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> you understand? Why would I say that? It's yeah. so, like the loving thing for her to do is to never reject you. And in her emotional state, she doesn't feel like ever rejecting you no. anyway. No, she doesn't. So, so, you know, why would I then invite, ask somebody to do what is the opposite of what they feel? Definitely not. Thank you. Okay. Other questions?
Oh, well, we got time? Oh, we can pick one or two more in. Um, now, there is a really good question here that needs to be asked. Is everyone okay with continuing for another 10 minutes or so? It's actually out past already. So. Yeah, we've got 15 minutes on the tape. we got 15 minutes on the tape, so. Okay. So this one's um, between a partnership. And the woman writes, we have a sexual situation where he can be in orgasm almost constantly without ejaculation while I'm not aroused. I have a sore spot in the vagina, shame, and find it hard to stop him because he's in orgasm and angry because he's having an enjoyable experience and I'm not. Occasionally I fall into energetic ecstasy but not often. He says he'd rather not make love at all than cause unnecessary pain, which causes the woman to then feel a scary rejection. Yeah. All right. um, so who do we look at first, the man or the woman? Let's perhaps look at the woman first. She's feeling, firstly, if she doesn't have sex, she feels that she, she feel, feels that she will be rejected. Mm -hmm. So, what emotion is she avoiding? The feeling of rejection, mm -hmm. right? So she needs to go into that. So, if he decide one thing that would help her is he say, if he says, right, we're not having sex because you're in pain, and he just does not have sex with her until she's no longer in pain, then that will cause her to feel sexually rejected, which is one of the emotions she needs to allow herself to feel. Does that make sense? Now, a second question I have though for the man is why are you having sex with a woman who's in pain when you're having sex? See, there must be something else going on because if I was having sex with Mary and I could feel her pain, I would stop immediately. You follow me? So you're not obviously feeling her pain in that instance, and you are continuing for some reason. Why is that? There must be something going on inside of you causing you to do that. So fine, you might you are obviously having a good time because you're in orgasm constantly, but my question is, who are you having the relationship with? And what's happening to this woman while you're in this state? And I and I also question that perhaps there may be a connection with some with a spirit perhaps in this entire process, um, because how could you be in orgasm constantly and not notice the feelings of the woman in that state? So the truth is, if Mary feels an emotion while I'm making love to Mary, mm -hmm. I have to stop. I can't go on. Love prevents me from going on. Love prevents me from going on. So if love isn't preventing you from going on, then you need to have a look, the male I mean in this case, needs to have a look at why it's not preventing you from going on. What is it about the act itself that causes you to continue knowing, and I'm assuming that you know, or perhaps you don't, but if you don't, then why aren't you feeling it from your partner? But why would you continue going on if you felt it unless there was a, some other emotion of, and let me say it, selfishness going on inside of yourself with regard to the sex act. And the woman, on the woman's side, let's look at the woman's side. On the woman's side, you need to look very seriously at why you're allowing yourself to have painful sex just for the sake of his pleasure. There's something going on there. So, what I suggest is going on is the male has some anger-based issues with women and the woman has some issues with men with regard to allowing themselves to be hurt or abused by a man, right? Now, I'm not saying he's abusing her, I'm saying she has those issues which attracts the man to have sex with her without consideration of her feelings. So, both need to work through some emotional issues. The question I have though for the male is how can he be in constant orgasm in this situation without there being a third party involved? And I suggest the third party is a spirit involved. Right. Now without talking to you privately or personally about that issue, I can't really offer much more assistance. Um, 
and I'll be able to show you how to connect to it if we talk privately or personally about it. But do you understand what's going on there? If you're making love to a person, male or female, doesn't matter, if you're making love to a person and you know they're hurting, <coughs> then why are you continuing? If you're making love to the person and they're hurting and you don't even know, then how connected are you to them? And if you're being made love to and you're hurting, why aren't you immediately voicing that and withdrawing until you work out why you're hurting? Can you see there's quite a lot of issues in there of self-love and love of the other person? Good one. Last one? Yep. This is the last one. This is a nice one. We were in a relaxed situation with the potential for intimacy. I was sitting on the bed feeling calm and somewhat expanded. I sensed a shaft of energy come down from a clear space above me through my body. It brought with it a feeling of aliveness. I understood at the time that it was the pure sexual energy of Father God being made available as a potential expression through me. It led to a vibrant feeling but not, strong, not a strong feeling of arousal. I have wondered about the true nature of this experience. Um, I think just go with your feelings. <coughs> you know, pretty accurate, I feel. The, the issue, though, is that if we receive external energy from something external to ourselves, there are only two possible sources. The two possible sources are a spirit or God. Right? They're the only two possible sources. Oh, I, when I say a spirit, any person on earth is in a spirit form as well, of course, so you can be receiving it from a person on earth. So I suppose you could say there's three possible sources. But, but, the, but the energy coming from above, obviously, is from one of those two sources. So allow yourself to experience it and also allow what um, inspiration comes with it. So as you feel that energy and ask yourself the question, you'll get the answer almost straight away. And yes, God has given us this beautiful gift of sexual intimacy and God wants us to express that in a loving environment. And in particular, in the end, God wants us to express that with our soulmates so that we can experience the bliss of that union. So God is going to often train us in that process if we allow ourselves to connect to God in that manner. Uh, a spirit, by the way, can also give us similar feelings. Um, and so we need to be you know, careful about how we feel. Are we feeling some kind of negative emotion with that expression coming through us? And if that's the case, then whoever is giving us that emotion is out of harmony with love in the majority of cases. So this is why many people, when they walk into a room, they feel the energy of the room and they feel that it's quite down Right? There's a law of attraction going on anyway, but if they feel it's quite down, then it's because the energy in the room is down. And there's something going on. And allow yourself to feel it, because that's your law of attraction, you're there. But most of the time, feelings from spirits who are a higher condition than ourselves will be pleasurable. And of course, experiences from God will be the most pleasurable experiences. So allow yourself to feel them, even if they feel sexual or in this case it's not really sexual in nature it's an awareness of your own sexual power that's coming through and do you mind me saying it's your question Brian? No, no, no. The, the reason why this is happening is because you had an experience about uh, five six weeks ago when you went out to bush by yourself yes. and you connected to yourself as a male yes. you went through quite a lot of emotions working through yourself and you started connecting to your own masculinity before then, you could say, in a lot of ways, you were emasculated. And after that experience, you're now connecting to your masculine energy, which actually then allows the masculine energy from God to enter and pass through you. Good day. All right, well, that's uh, the end of our session today. Hopefully, it's been interesting for you. The, um, we've got another session on sex and sexuality coming up the next time we're here. That session, we'll be looking specifically at all of the different types of injuries we have and what kind of things we can do to overcome those injuries in a practical way. So that's what we'll be looking at next time and then there'll be questions associated with that on the following day.
Th thank you for your time, both Mary Thanks, and myself. Thank you.